Hi, I'm Dale Peterson, and I'm going to talk to you today about the ICS security product market. I want to give you the most value I can in the time we have, so I'm going to be very blunt and direct. So please don't tell this to any of the product vendors because some of them are angry at me already. But I want to start out by putting something in your mind here. If you think this is not possible in ICS, so a lot of times there will be a new product, new product category that will come out and people will say, oh, that'll never work in ICS. Understand that it probably will. It's something we've been hearing about Ethernet. Uh, we've been hearing it about antivirus. Uh, the example I have here is back in 2006, DHS funded my company Digital Bond to develop some IDS signatures, intrusion detection signatures. It was passive only and everyone said it was impossible. Virtualization, cloud services now. So if you get this knee-jerk reaction when someone's talking to you about a product that, hey, this won't work in ICS, chances are it probably will eventually. It just might be a couple of years later. So keep an open mind. Now, when we talk about products, we have to be really careful because companies, especially senior management, like to think they can solve their security problems by buying a product. Products certainly can help, but they're only part of the solutions. And one of the challenges we have, and you'll see it in this presentation, is a lot of these product companies have a tremendous amount of marketing dollars and impact. So what they're doing is they're hitting your executive saying, this is what you really need. This is what you really need. They're very aggressive. And it's important for you when you're talking about your ICS security program to really communicate with your executives. Because if they don't understand what you're doing and buy into what you're doing, one of these product vendors is going to come along, convince them that this is what they should do. And once they have that in their mind, it's almost impossible to dissuade them. So you really need to come up with your product strategy. Now, I'm going to talk mostly about the detection and asset management markets in the ICS security realm. But I want to hit a couple of others just for completeness. For example, endpoint protection. Uh, hopefully you've been looking at application whitelisting, replacing your antivirus. Or at least if you have to run antivirus, run in them both. But really it's a much better solution. Antivirus is only gonna find mass market malware. It's not gonna find any sophisticated attacker. It's not gonna find anyone who wants to evade antivirus. So you really should be looking at application whitelisting. It's an ideal technology for the ICS space. I've been waiting to see if someone's actually gonna do endpoint protection for PLCs or controllers. I've seen some research papers, but they're still bleeding edge. So I think we're at least three years away from a credible solution for that. On the remote access front, I'm sure you've been bombarded with remote access white papers and webinars. Uh, with COVID, it's something we're all looking at with much more seriousness. The key thing here is you have to have two-factor authentication for all your remote access. 80% of the breaches in the ICS world now are from remote access. Actually, that was just a totally made-up stat, but it's a huge number, just like most of the stats in ICS are made up. 87%, I don't know if it's 92 or 74 the vast majority of the incidents you hear about in ICS are related to someone getting on the enterprise network and riding in on credentials they recovered, single factor credential remote access. So you really should be looking at two factor remote access as a very high priority item if you're not doing it already. And on the perimeter front, uh, really the only thing that's been interesting is unidirectional. That's the one way the data diode, so it will allow you to send things, let's say, from the control system to the enterprise or from the safety system to the control system. And we're seeing it used more in some places because people say, oh, this is unhackable. There's no way to send information back in the other direction. But we're also kind of predicting that this will be less used because more two-way communication is required. We're seeing more communication to the cloud, more communication to the uh, enterprise. But if you're doing something like predictive maintenance, you wanna send data out to the cloud for predictive maintenance purposes, uh, unidirectional is tremendous for that. 
if you want the vendor to be able to go in and let's say change a boiler setting, you can't use unidirectional. In that case, you would really want something like deep packet inspection that would say, I'm gonna let my cloud service provider make these changes within this range, but that's it. I keep waiting to see one of the cloud service providers offer this, but to date they have not. So we'll have to see if that comes. It really will only come if the asset owners demand it. Because think about it, if you're a cloud service provider, why do you want to limit what you can do? You'd rather be able to do everything and just tell them, hey, we create a secure tunnel, we have two-factor authentication. Um, so we'll see what happens there. So now let's dive into what started as the detection market back in 2015. And you'll see why I said started in just a minute. So what happened was around 2015, there was this huge tidal wave of companies, about 30 companies coming out with a very similar product to detect ICS attacks or incidents on the network, basically by passively listening on the network. And they raised a tremendous amount of money. They raised over a half a billion dollars in venture funds and still going. So you can imagine with all that money and all that competition, if you're the surfer here, you're kind of like the asset owner where you're just getting bombarded with webinars and articles and, and presentations at conferences. It got so much more mind share than it deserved, even though it is an interesting category. I would encourage you to look at Rebecca Moore's S420 presentation that was from January in this year when we could have live conferences, but she worked for a large oil and gas company and at her refinery site, they deployed one of these. And she looks at the actual costs involved in using one of these detection solutions. And her argument is you should really make sure that this is the next thing you should be doing before you spend those resources. Because Ideally, you want to spend your money and your time on that which will maximize your risk reduction, not just on the shiny thing that's being marketed from a million different points with a lot of different money. So this marketplace actually had a problem. What happened was companies saw these demonstrations, they saw this detection capability, but then they also saw how much information was being provided how difficult it would be for them to actually use it, especially those that had fairly immature programs and weren't doing much detection now. So they're saying, oh, this looks great, but I can't really use this. But the funny thing happened, when they were getting these demos, one of the things the products did was created an asset inventory based on what was talking on the network. And most of these companies only had a spreadsheet that was maybe years old and very inaccurate. So they were saying, oh, wow, that's great. So I can get some sort of asset inventory from this product, I need one of those, let me buy it. And you saw, I would say even up till this year, a lot of these quote detection products that were purchased were purchased primarily for their asset inventory capabilities. Early on, there was this question, again, going back to this just won't work in ICS. Uh, the early vendors all said, hey, we're passive only. We only listen on the network. We don't introduce any traffic on the network because the asset owners were saying, I can't put you on my network if you introduce traffic. So there was this belief that passive was going to take the day. Of course, it wasn't difficult to predict that active was going to be the solution because quite frankly, it's better. You get more information you're actually using the same protocols like an engineering workstation would use to get the information. Now, since I'm at a PAS event, they do things a little bit differently, but also I would call it active. They download project files and, and other types of files from the control system and then basically parse those out. So rather than going to the end devices, they go to the system that is programming the end device. But both of these methodologies get you much better information than if you were just listening on the network. And what ended up happening was they were getting in bake-offs and the companies that were doing active 
their asset inventory was so much better that eventually these companies said, hey, we're going to do active as well. So probably back in, I think, 2017, I made this prediction and it's come true. I'm not, you can run these products passively, but all of them have an active option and they're marketing it more heavily just because they're getting better data. Now, as they started to, I don't want to say pivot, but let's say add asset inventory capabilities, a lot of these detection products were saying, hey, all you need to do for asset management is you buy our product and you get detection and you get asset management. But not really, because what you see is you're getting a partial okay asset inventory. But asset management includes the things you see up here, configuration management, change management. There's a lot of elements to a true asset management solution. So you were just getting really that asset inventory and maybe some vulnerability management in those detection solutions. And even when you look at the asset inventory, what you find is that it's not really everything you need. It is just getting you basic information like the IP address. Maybe it'll tell you it's a PLC. Depending on what's shared, it can tell you some applications and OS versions, but it's missing those items in red. It doesn't tell you where it's physically located or the criticality or who's responsible. Or there's a long list. If you look at a true asset management system and the fields that are there, you'll see that these asset inventories being provided in the detection solutions are just a small part of it, let alone missing change management and these other elements. So really there's a question of, will you have an asset management solution, a detection solution, or a combination solution? And also, how are you gonna handle response? So I guess the, my first prediction that hasn't already come true is I'm convinced that asset management and detection will be two separate solutions just because they're very different purposes and it's hard to build a product that does one or that does both of those well. You're gonna want an asset management product that does that well and a detection product that does that well and you're gonna want them to talk to each other. So for example, if I'm monitoring the network in my SOC with my SIM, I'm gonna to wanna to have the asset inventory there. It's gonna help me respond and deal with incidents and data that I'm seeing. Similarly, if I'm an asset management solution, I'm gonna want my ICS detection solution to tell me when there's something new on the network that maybe isn't in my asset inventory so that I can go investigate it. I'm gonna talk more about that in a little bit. Uh, vulnerability management is very interesting. I'm watching this closely because it requires the asset inventory and we're seeing a lot of these asset management and detection solutions actually create a vulnerability management capability to identify the vulnerabilities in the systems. Um, but then you actually have to go about patching the system and you have to decide what to patch when. Now I've come up with recently, I released this ICS patch decision tree that gives you a, a um, a scheduled ASAP or defer answer to that question. But it'd be curious to see how these systems and how vulnerability management systems help you identify what to patch when in ICS, rather than just say, hey, we gotta patch everything every month. We know that doesn't make sense from a risk reduction standpoint. Um, and then I guess the last thing on vulnerability management is you actually have to apply the patch. So I'm not sure if the vulnerability management shouldn't be part of the system that applies the patch, or at a minimum, it's gonna to need to communicate with that system. For example, you don't wanna get this long list of patches that need to be applied and then have to enter them into the system applying the patches. You're at least gonna want those two to communicate and potentially the vulnerability management system that applies the patch might be best to tell you what to patch. But we'll see where that goes. Now let's look at really the detection market. So first of all, you don't necessarily want to start with one of these new detection products. 
What I always suggest you do is create a list of detection sources of information and then prioritize that list and decide, okay, where am I going to get my best information with my least amount of noise? So if you look at your antivirus or application whitelisting alerts, if you're not monitoring that, you don't need a, one of these fancy detection products because that's something that's high fidelity. Every time you see an alert, you should investigate and you see some other options up there. At some point in this list, you might get to one of these detection products. So just remember, one of the key things is that these detection products are just part of your response. They are not your sole response. The other thing to think about is what is your response gonna be? If you spend a lot of money and effort detecting potential incidents and don't have the capability to respond, what have you really accomplished? I would say you would want to actually get your response in place before you invest heavily in detection. Again, because without the response, the detection really isn't doing much except causing you worry. So I have a prediction here too, and that is a lot of these companies that are doing detection right now, that are selling detection products, I actually think they're going to turn more into incident response companies. They'll put their product in your network. They'll know what it's doing. Maybe they'll even pass the information up to their SOC. And then all of a sudden, when you need level two or level three support on a potential incident in your ICS, you will call on them. Because except for maybe the largest asset owners, it's not going to make sense to build up an ICS incident response team. That is just a specialized skill that is, quite frankly, still rarely needed. Now, one thing to look at is you're getting this data from this ICS detection solution and your other ports. What are you going to do with it? You know, are you going to, let's say, if you took a Clarity or Nozomi or Dragos, are you going to use that, that GUI and just look at that? Are you going to send it to an OT SOC? So not your enterprise SOC, but you're going to, are you going to build a new OT SOC? Or are you going to send everything up to the enterprise? And I will tell you that the winner here so far is send it up to the enterprise. There was a, a session, it was on the sponsor stage at 2019, it was a CyberX session and it was really funny because they invited one of their good customers who love their product up on stage with them. And the customer's talking and he said, well, you know, we really never look at the CyberX product, we just use that to configure it. We send all that data to IBM's Q Radar and we look at it there. And I think that's what you're gonna find. That's what's gonna happen. So what this is going to lead to is these GUIs. So if you are looking at a detection product, you're getting these demonstrations from these vendors showing you all these great things about their GUIs. Reality is that you're probably not going to be looking at those GUIs. Your SOC is going to be looking at Splunk or QRadar or whatever they're using, and the data is going to go there, which would mean then that the value of that screen and all those great things they're providing is going to go down, and we're going to see pricing go down with that. Again, we're going to start to see these, these systems talk to each other. Right now, the communication is using REST API in many cases, but it's very crude. It's essentially just data dumping from one to another. It was great to see this summer that Splunk, which is a SEM, added an add-on for OT security. And this was just the first baby step, but it was still impressive. So in this case, you could send your OT asset inventory to Splunk with context. So you, for example, you could say this is a PLC and you could say this is critical or non-critical. So you started to have some of those and then they started doing some correlations on what they call notables and creating alerts. So this is just, again, I'd say this is 1% of what is possible. But you're going to see this integration grow. Uh, some of it might be done through consultants that specialize in this tool. Hopefully the vendors themselves, both the ICS detection vendors and the SIM vendors will do this. But this is where the world's going. Another prediction that doesn't bode well for detection products is right now they're deploying these little boxes. 
and they'll put them on your network. They'll connect them to a span port on the switch and you got to put them all over your network. Well, of course, that doesn't make much sense. That capability should be native in the switch. There's no reason it, not, it shouldn't be. And we really saw, I, you could almost say this prediction came true because Cisco bought Centrio, one of the competitors in the detection space. And you can read the quote there. They're just saying this should be integrated into the switch. We're seeing partnerships between the vendors and the switch manufacturers. I think this is something you're going to see in the next two years. You're going to see very few boxes except for legacy networks. And quite frankly, it's going to be cheaper for you to buy a new switch with this capability than to buy this ICS detection box to put out in all your systems. And let's be honest, a lot of ICS need their switches to be upgraded. So I've talked about lots of change here. You know, so first of all, you've got the, in the detection space, the real detection space, you know, I think asset inventory is going to be separated. So you're going to have your PASs and other competitors that are really going to be looked at for asset management capabilities. And then, then there's going to be detection solutions and they're going to be two separate paths. Now this might take a little while because a lot of times still, you know, asset owners, I know a lot of you in the room there are saying, can I just buy one product? Or I only have this amount of money, I can only buy one product. But if you do that, just realize it's an interim solution. Eventually you're gonna have an asset management solution and a separate detection solution. Secondly, the GUI isn't gonna matter because you're gonna send everything to your SEM. The GUI is gonna be primarily for configuration. The sensors are gonna be in your switches. And the last thing is, probably any of these detection vendors you buy are likely to be acquired, which may or may not affect your product. For example, I mentioned CyberX. Well, CyberX got bought by Microsoft. I don't think Microsoft has a lot of interest in sending out sensor, box sensor boxes or selling switches. You know, so if you've got that CyberX product, it doesn't mean you have to abandon it now, but in two to three years, you better have a solution to move some move to something else. So here's what I would do if I were an asset owner today, and this is what I recommend to my asset owner clients, is I would start with an asset management solution. Okay, I, I think that's really where the value is because using that detection solution is gonna take a lot of resources, but you can get immediate value with an asset management solution. And then after you have that in place, get a detection solution. Now you're gonna do two things here. One is you're gonna to wanna to make sure it integrates well with your asset management solution. Because one of the things, one of the two main things it's gonna do is tell you when there's something new on your network. And that should be past your asset management solution. And secondly, it's gonna retain forensic records. So it's actually not doing detection in this mode. It's just saying, if an, inc if an incident happens, I've got a rich data set for some incident responder to come in and look at. And then that would be my third step. Once I've done those two things and had some additional budget, I would get an incident responder on retainer, someone who understood the detection solution I picked extremely well. So they can just come in on day one. And then finally, once I've done that, then I would focus on SOC integration. Now, hopefully you get there, but you wanna get there in the right order. Now, when you're trying to select a detection solution, it's really hard. With asset inventory, you can connect it up to your network and you can see, see what it sees and compare. Well, this, this product saw all these things, this one saw more or less, and you can pick a winner. With detection, it's really hard because you don't have a lot of incidents happening on your network and the vendor will come in with canned incidents and guess what? They can find their own incidents. So, when we did this ICS detection challenge, we spent over 600 hours setting it up. And this was with some really, really smart people that did this for a living. So it might take you thousands of hours to do this test. And quite frankly, a lot of companies just can't do it. So when I look at rating these companies, and I, I write a lot of it about these companies and podcasts and track the market, these are the things I look at. You know, who's getting, who's actually getting in the door? Is the company growing? Do they have enough resources? 
because they all tend to eventually get up to a similar level. But you really want to make sure it's sustainable. Now, if we look at the market back in 2018, here you can see a, a layout of the tiers that I had. But you had about 30 companies back in 2018 and four real top tier vendors. Not a lot has changed except we've seen a lot of acquisitions. This is just in the last two years and most of them in 2020. As you can see there, a lot of the second tier vendors have been acquired. In fact, the second tier is very sparse now. So where we are today is we have three clear top tier vendors, you see up there, a couple of others that are, have jumped into the second tier, almost more because there was no one else in the second tier. And then the third tier has really emptied out. A lot of uh, maybe 10 or so companies have given up on this product line. And then we have a vendor tier that you see at the bottom. Now, the way to look at this is, for example, if I'm a Four Scout customer on the enterprise, then I want to look high. I think I'm highly incentivized to seriously consider the Four Scout OT solution and almost look at it as saying, there's got to be a reason not to select it because the integration over time is going to be so beneficial to my company. But if I'm not a Four Scout um, user on the enterprise side, well, then I'm unlikely to select Forescout. Same with those other ones. So that's how I'd look at that vendor tier. And so I've covered a lot of ground here. I want to leave you with one final prediction. Uh, that is what we're seeing now, 2020, 2021, we're seeing these solutions, both asset management and detection, compete in three areas. One, vulnerability management two risk scores, so assigning a risk score to a cyber asset or a security zone, and three, compliance. Compliance with things like NERC SIP and Electric or IEC 62443. So you're gonna see a lot of attention to that. And the, quite frankly, the reason they're competing in those three areas is that's what the asset owners are asking them for.